Okay, thank you. Um, we will take some questions. Uh, the uh, refreshments at the back, by the way, will be open again when we finish our little session here. So, questions from the floor? Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. My name's Dave. Thank you for a very informative talk. I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, should, what should Greece do? Should Greece default and get out of the Euro? Just like I, Iceland? I mean, Iceland's in good shape because they said, the hell with you. Mm -hmm. you, you, you're crazy, you, you spent all your money, we ain't gonna repay you. No. I, I, think, uh, I think there is no way, really, a default is not sufficient. I mean, Greece has to restructure its economy. It's completely yeah. out of, uh, out of uh, it cannot afford uh, uh, its standard of living. It cannot afford, uh, imagine, and if it leaves, it will reacquire some policy flexibility. There is really no way. They are delaying the inevitable. Unless they are willing to pay for 10 years uh, <laughs> to the tune of uh, 20, 30 billion dollars a year for 30 years to give Greece the, the opportunity to stay in and restructure the economy. Right. So Greece, I think, when the, the, at the end of the day, may have to, certainly it will have to declare default. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't declare, the markets <laughs> will declare it for it. And there is no way that Greece can come back at the, on these conditions uh, without restructuring for, we want fixed exchange rates, but when you, are of, uh, when you are out of equilibrium that much, you have to reacquire. Look, at our, the same happened to Argentina and so on. Argentina tried to hold on and then eventually had to, in order to restructure, in order to allow time, but it cannot do it within under these conditions. I, as I said, if uh, European banks and governments are willing to give Greece 20, 30 billion dollars of gifts for the next 10 years, then Greece can stay in and have the time to restructure. restructure. Otherwise, no way. And of course, I say this, and I stand by what I say. Now, my closest friend is Robert Mondel, mm -hmm. one of my closest friends, and we disagree on certain things, but he can have the Nobel all he wants. He says China will never allow its currency to become convertible. And I say, that's nonsense. And let's wait. We're, I used to go with Dornbush around. And we went to banks and we spoke to the uh, bank officers, closed doors, then to the best customers. And he used to say something. Sometimes I said something else. And he would start an argument publicly. I said, Rudy, we don't have to disagree. Within a month, six months, we will know who's right and who's wrong, period. So now, how can you say, I study the financial sector of China. China's preparing Shanghai to be the equivalent of London and New York. Now, until the currency becomes convertible, it cannot do so, but it's preparing. Already a great deal of trade is in ones with Russia and with Brazil. Already, you, in other words, they are moving, not just what they are saying, but what they are saying and by their actions, it indicates that it's moving toward a convertible to make the one convertible. And let the time see who's right and who's wrong. So he doesn't like it. I said, well, that's my opinion, that's yours. I think I'm right, we'll see, we'll see. And when Rudy Dornbush died, I thought this is the end of, a, of an odd couple, <laughs> me and him. And someone said, no, because we kept record of what you said and what he said, and you were right more than twice as much as him. So we will continue. So that's, uh, uh, again, sometimes in lectures like this, sometimes you push the envelope a bit. But we are here to push the envelope a bit, in a sense, so that to stimulate thinking and discussion. And if I'm wrong, I'm willing to learn. That's my view. If, uh, if not, uh, you know, we have to accept what I, what is, what I say. In international finance, there is this concept of the so-called structural deficit. And if you're a hardliner, you ignore that. But uh, it's, it's very commonly discussed in IMF and establishment circles. And a friend of mine who's gone through the Greek numbers says the problem is, even if Greek de Greece defaulted tomorrow morning, they still would have a structural of deficit course. because they do not collect enough in taxes to pay the government's expenses, which would then force them to borrow to continue anything resembling the current standard of living. And after they have defaulted, who will lend to them? Yeah. You so it's, it's a, yeah. Uh, he's entirely right. So you see, in Italy, people are against the finance minister. 
the finance minister kept the budget deficit below 5%. Now, and he did it before the crisis. If he did not keep that budget deficit below 5%, Italy would have ended up like Greece. It may still by being by contagion. Uh, and he did it before the crisis. You see, things you do before the crisis may be sufficient. The same thing after the crisis. You know, financial markets always attack the weakest link. Okay? So now, when they realize that there is some tension between the prime minister, the buffoon, <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, the rigorous minister of finance, that's when markets really exploded and felt that if you add to the big uh, budget, uh, uh, debt, you add political instability, then that rigor will go away and Italy will go by the wayside. And of course, as I said, if Greece goes, we can survive. If Italy and Spain go, the euro will go. Right. That's the end. They cannot, uh, they cannot bail those countries out. I mean, Greece, Portugal, and Ireland are 3%, 4% of total GDP. Italy and Spain, uh, Italy and Spain together are more like 20%. They cannot uh, salvage that. Yeah, I, I was surprised by two omissions from your talk, and I wondered if you wanted to take this opportunity to remedy those. One is, from your list of causes of the crisis, you didn't mention the Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, in the list of causes for our trade deficit, you didn't mention the huge amounts we borrow to finance our government budget sure. deficit. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the first question was the, the uh, Federal Reserve. Fed's role in the crisis. Uh, you know, this is unbelievable. The US, as you know well, Professor White, between 2003 and 2004, kept the interest rate at 1%. Mm -hmm. and, and Greenspan, of course, was there, the maestro, you know. He was the, the best of the best, not by us common mortals, by other central bankers, until he fell off the pedestal. But what about, what about uh, Frank? What about Dodd? They said, and Stiglitz, the best thing going is Freddie Mac and Faye May. That they were, there was no chance, he wrote Stiglitz, there was no chance that they would ever go bankrupt or there was anything in there. And then they come and blame everybody else for the problem that they, uh, so certainly uh, this is, uh, that's one major, in other words, it was implicit when we received so much foreign capital, especially the savings of China, that allowed us to keep interest rate low, mm -hmm. which un 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 unjustifyingly low. And, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, and of course, when Greenspan talked, he didn't talk. He, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 he, uh, no, he, there's another beautiful word that, that uh, describes what he ruminated. He ruminated, you know, you, yeah. he talked for one hour and you never know, maybe central bankers have to do that. Remember what Bernanke did yesterday. <laughs> First, maybe we need more stimulus or more QE3. And then after he said that, he went to the other side. However, we don't know anything. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what we have to do. So it was implicit when I said that uh, uh, interest rates were kept artificially, artificially low, but implicit by the inflow of capital, which permitted that uh, uh, to occur. Uh, the other thing is in the, uh, in the, uh, in the deficit, uh, in the budget deficit. I mean, this is, uh, this is just... Uh, but I knew this was happening. If you want to increase taxes, what do you do? And you cannot do it directly. You spend like mad. You spend like mad, and then you have to supposedly increase taxes. And that's where we are, uh, that's where we are now. Uh, I, I think that this is, uh, uh, and let's put it this way. Suppose we want to give, suppose, and don't kick me or lynch me. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> suppose that the we wanted to try the stimulus package. Now we have tried it. What do we want, another stimulus package? Who's going to pay for that? We know, rational expectations. If we, if we have another stimulus package, we know our taxes will grow even more. Even, and what was the effect of that stimulus package? Suppose it eliminate, suppose, even a deeper crisis. Suppose, suppose. But what did they tell us it would do? It told, they told us unemployment would not rise above 8%. Said it would have been worse. Well, uh, certainly, if, if you spend $870 billion, uh, don't tell me that there is no simple effect. However, it also has a discouraging effect for the future. So where are we going now? Our debt is 100% of GDP. 
I never thought this country would reach. And then we are saying we should have more. So if we have another stimulus package, if you have QE3, what happens? The private sector will know that our taxes certainly will have to go up. And now we said, but we created whatever, two million jobs. What two million jobs? Do you realize that we, in order to, we should create 120, 130,000 jobs a month only to absorb the new entrance into the labor force. We created half of that. And according to that, our unemployment rate, as I said, should have been much higher. And why is it not much higher? Discouraged workers. You know, you don't find a job, you get out of, you're no longer unemployed if you don't look for a job. So really, really, the effect of that from what they told us is if they knew the effect, is completely off to what the actual results are. And now we want to go more. So at this point, that's where the liberal and the conservative come clashing, uh, crashing down. The question is, what happens if the economy slows down even more? Conservatives say, of course it's liar. Have these people ever been in a corporation? If they had been in a corporation, they would know that the worst thing you can do to a corporation is uncertainty. How much they will pay in taxes, how much they will pay for the health plan. They stay on the, on the sidelines. But they have not been in corporations, and they think that the way to go is to increase, uh, to increase taxes. There is nothing. So now the question, is, the question is, what is? Do we go for another stimulus package, or do we allow the market to do what it does best? In Europe, they make me laugh. Some government said, we will create half a million jobs. The government creates nothing. The government creates the conditions for allowing the private sector to create jobs. And so, so at this, this is where the clash, the, clash, uh, the clash is. But Obama plays a smart game. He wanted to increase taxes. He feels that, uh, that, that even, uh, even Lula, who is as leftist as they come, he doesn't even have a high school education. But he, is a, he had a little brain. He asked his advisors, we have too much inequality in this country. We want to reduce inequality, but we also want to grow fast. And the, the advisor said, well, there is, a, there is, as we know, there is a, a, a substitution effect. You cannot have both. And he said, will the poor people be poorer if we grow faster with a little more inequality, or will they be worse off? And the answer was clear. They would be much better, the poor people, with a little more inequality and more rapid growth. And the leftist decided without hesitation, let's grow faster. Perhaps Obama should learn some of that, but that is where, that is where, that is where positive economics clashes with the, with the, uh, uh, with the, uh, uh, with the, the uh, welfare and, the, yeah, normative economics. Okay? But again, this is where, uh, where uh, I want to say, give the benefit of the doubt that the stimulus package would have worked, and I thought that by now we knew it didn't work. Right. And to come to me and say that it did some good, of course, you spend $800 billion, unless you throw it in the wind, I don't know. That you, but was it worth it, the money that we spent? I don't believe so. And now we want to go for more, but that's where the clash is. That's how I was, in fact, with the wind coming to me in Washington, with the air conditioning, I became even nastier when I, when I spoke my piece. Right. We'll take two more questions if there are any. And I'll be short. Yeah. Uh, well, new, newcomer, but go ahead, go ahead, yeah. Have we exchanged corporate debt for sovereign debt in the world? So that sovereign debt is now the, the primary failure mode? Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, very much. It's getting very much so. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, it's, yes, I think so. I think so. Sorry, short answer, but I... Yeah, but we've been there before in the 1980s, for example, in Latin America. That, that yeah. was true, that uh, in numerous countries, uh, private debt was exchanged for corporate debt. And then, I'm sorry, the... Sovereign debt was exchanged for corporate debt, and uh, then the sovereign debt went into default. Yeah. So that's sort of where we are. And I think if you paid attention to what he was saying about the banks in Europe 
and their role in the restructuring of these debts. Uh, that's essentially the same message today that in country after country, the, the nation state is being put on the forefront with sovereign debt in order to avoid debt write downs, asset write downs within the banks inside Europe. But we are, we, are, we are governed by people who lack the basic, basic things. I mean, we have a little fun. You see, in the world, I work a lot. But we say, if we have value added, if you come out of this, not from necessarily what I say, by stimulating thought, with something positive, and in the process, we have a little fun. I went to the European Commission when Germany and France decided to pass a law to reduce the work week from 40 to 35 hours. Remember mm -hmm. I mentioned? Yeah. I mean, for those who weren't here, I said, can you identify who was the French economist and the German economist? And I told them, I would like to go to a Broadway show, but I don't have time. But what, I, what I've heard here today is better than a Broadway show. Sometimes reality is funnier than a joke. Because if you go from, you don't have to be an economist, if you go from 40 to 35 hours, specifically in order to create more job. So you, for, from 40 to 35 hours, every seven workers that work 35 hours instead of 40, they release 35 hours creating one more job. Mm -hmm. I said, well, according to that, then if that's the rule, why don't we go to 30 hours? We'll have even more job. Why don't we go to 25 hours a week? We have full employment. Something is amiss. You don't have to be economist. And what was amiss? They wanted to go from 40 to 35 hours with the same weekly wage, which meant that the wage per hour increased. And I told these PhDs, saying, but in economics, in micro, I have one of the leading texts also, not just internet. I said, in micro, we have the law of demand, not the hypothesis of demand, not the theory of demand, but the law of demand. But when the price of something increases, we buy less of it. And what happened? Firms realized 40 to 35 hours a week, the wage per hour increased, that they substituted capital for labor. And, so the, and the proof of what I say, labor unions, after a few years, rebelled, said, what kind of an economy? You told us it would create more jobs, it has the opposite effect. We want to go back voluntarily to 38 hours, to 40, to, uh, 40 hours a week with the same weekly pay. I mean, more proof than that. But the, and what about Trichet? who in June of 2008 says explicitly, you see, talked explicitly, not like rumination. He said that Europe was so big, was so self-contained, no interdependence, that he increased interest rates from 4% to 4 and a quarter because Europe would not go into a, a crisis. <laughs> Only a blind man. These are the people who are in charge. And then suddenly, he realized, and he had to r crash down the, the interest rate to 1% in order to overcome the problem. But this, sometimes you feel that these people ought to know a little more, a little more, or to be a little more objective mm -hmm. and not be blinded by their right or left leanings. You know, they have to look at the evidence of what, uh, of what but we don't have that. Uh, Seth. Seth. Yeah, well, they were thinking, did it work for us in the 1980s for Latin America? The Brady Plan, when yeah. it finally came, it did work. It did, it was, it, yeah. The Brady Plan, for those who don't remember it, uh, Treasury Secretary Nicholas Brady, Brady in 1989 proposed that the banks agree to write down 35 to 45 percent of the value of Latin American debt in return for which the Treasury would sell the Latin American countries a special issue of zero coupon bonds maturing in 30 years. So if the banks held the bonds for the 30 years, they would get their nominal money back. Uh, but the central element here was a 35% immediate write down of the debt value. And as soon as the countries signed up for the Brady Plan, surprise, surprise, right. growth returned in Latin America. All the economies started growing again. You see, this institute does something extremely useful. We have to learn from the past. We don't know the past. And we, people who don't know the past, 
have the same, uh, will, will face. Uh, once uh, uh, Stigler, who was a most distinguished, not Stiglitz, a most Stigler distinguished Nobel Prize winner, wrote an article that if we have small firms coexisting over time, over time, with large firms, this is evidence that we have no economies of scale. You see, right. on one point in time, you can have small firms and large firms, but the large firms, if there are economies of scale, are in the process of driving the small firms out of business. But if over time, small firms coexist with large firms, then this is evidence that we do not have economies of scale in that industry. Mm -hmm. So I wrote a little piece saying, but John Stuart Mills had one chapter in his Principles of Political Economy precisely discussing that, the survival test. Mm -hmm. Has George Stigler not read that piece since he never mentions John Stuart Mill? Mm -hmm. Or he wishes and hopes that we did not read it mm -hmm. since he had no reference uh, to it. And I, I feel bad because he was the most, the most uh, distinguished. So we have to go back. You see, the Brady, m most people study, and we go back. Exchange rates have no effect on the trade balance. It drives me back to the 1940s. Of course, I was born then. I wasn't there. But all the discussion with Maclop and so on, that you need both. You need the structural balance, saving investment, and then you need, you need the income and the price effect to have an effect. We're going back without understanding. We forget the past and we, try, we, re, we reinvent and sometimes not as good as the past. So mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. it's very important to go back to the past to learn from the past and understand so that we know what we are talking about and not face into the same trap or rediscover the will and waste time. And I think this institute does a really wonderful uh, job, among other things, to, uh, uh, to, to study this as uh, the, the IMF and so on, as you've mm -hmm. done. Uh, to be nice to Bobo, I'll let him ask one question. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> government debt, external debt, has to equal to zero. For the entire world. Entire, entire world. Yes. So as you mentioned, <coughs> you know, the firms are highly leveraged before the crisis. Household in US and, and Europe too are highly leveraged. And there's no way that uh, in this, the trade deficits are still going on. There's no way external debt can be you know, pay down right away. So, where, unless the government ran deficit, where will you find, what will you, how the household and the private sector will deleverage? Well, the, uh, 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 you know, the trade deficit doesn't have to be zero. It has to be sustainable, number one. In other words, the United States need not have a zero uh, trade deficit. But as long as it is sustainable, by capital inflows. Now, when you are unsustainable, but a great deal of adjustment is actually taking place. Families in the US are beginning to save more. Families in China are beginning to spend more and save less. Martin Feldstein wrote a piece saying that he foresees by the end of the decade of this imbalance gradually being naturally eliminated. China, in the next five-year plan, stressed more public, uh, more, uh, more, uh, 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 more consumption at home, and, uh, and people will begin to... Sp in other words, there is... First of all, we don't have to be in equilibrium balanced. I mean, it's the balance of payments that has to be sustainable. Secondly, there is much more adjustment than meets the eye, but it will take many years to, uh, to occur. Uh, and so, uh, but uh, again, uh, f families have learned, are learning, but there are still millions of families who's in the US, whose home is worth less than the mortgage. And, you know, they're underwater as the expression goes. While in China, they have not enough ways to invest and they try to buy apartments. So now there is a bubble and China put a limit. In Shanghai, you want a car? 
you cannot get a license unless somebody sells the plate and so on, because there is too So in other words, uh, but, but as soon as China does something which is appropriate in a sense to eliminate, people find other ways. It's very difficult, but there is more adjustment than meets the eye in the United States and uh, uh, gradually. Do we have the time to gradually adjust? That's, uh, but I, first of all, I heard half of your question because I forgot to move this way with this yeah. year. <laughs> but I don't know if I answered, I answered the part of the My question. My question is, if, where are the sources of the, if the household and the corporations are to de deleverage, you know, and the global debt has to be zero, now where's the source of that income for the household and the private sector? Where is it coming from? Yeah. Are you talking? For the well, private I mean, sector. So, yeah. but, so if, for the private sector. If the sector. government does, is also running surplus at the time, where's the source? Of, of the elimination? Yeah, of the, de of the leverage. Well, I mean, uh, if the U.S. Uh, grows faster, families save more, there is less unemployment, they learned, hopefully, the lesson of uh, living beyond their means, although some of it was stimulated, as we said, by the government, mm -hmm. and they will begin to save more, have more to... I mean, that's the way. But again, all of these things do not, will not happen overnight. These are structural problems. We are not dealing, you know, they worry about uh, uh, fine tuning. Fine tuning is a cyclical thing. These are structural problems. Take Italy, the only way out of it is to grow, and they're not growing, and they deserve not to grow because they have all sorts of policy in place that don't work. I mean, this is, this is unbelievable. If you are a firm and you are a woman, who, uh, who have a baby. Now, we know from psychology that nothing helps a child and the intelligence of a child more than the mother taking care of the child. The first year or two are tremendously formative. That means a woman would have to stay home for two years, and that's wonderful. But then, you pay the firm in Europe. So now a firm will not want to hire a woman, but that's discrimination and they cannot do it. But now they have to pay, say, for three workers in order to make sure that they have two. And so there is all sorts of things now. There are many things that I say, this is wonderful in Europe, wonderful. My mother worked 30 years in Italy, uh, uh, 10 years in Italy and 30 years here and receives a pension higher from Italy than the pension from the United States. This is wonderful. I say, you're very rich. <laughs> wonderful. But can we afford this? And so that is the problem. That is, there are many very useful things to do that we can do. But they're expensive. And so we have to decide how to do it. We want to give... Unim do you know, in Europe, if you lose a job, you are paid 80 90% of your wage for two years or more. That's wonderful. We cannot afford that. But do you also know that in the United States, before, we used to pay for 26 weeks unemployment insurance, and 50% or 60%. So in Europe, it's much better. But do you know that there was a miracle occurring in the United States? On the 25th week of unemployment, 90% of the unemployed found a job. What a miracle. In other words, there is to be some incentive. Incentive means a burden, a cost, but that is unfortunately necessary at times. We cannot afford, and so we have to decide what we can afford, what we can afford to help the people in need without discouraging the others. Mm -hmm. We have different, Europe doesn't have to be like the United States, and the United States doesn't have to be like Europe. But we wanted to rely more on individual decisions, individual responsibility, which meant more burden and less redistribution, which permitted us to grow faster. And now we want to be more like Europe. But again, not answering entirely your question, because we need more income. We need to grow more, otherwise, and it takes longer. We cannot solve these problems overnight. Okay, I am going to end it there, and I want to thank everyone for coming. Thank Professor Salvatore for his remarks. Thank you very much. Join us in the back.
Thank you. We, in order to enable Professor Salvatore to get.